So welcome to the third day of the Global Pathfinder Summit. Uh, because this is my first opportunity, I too would like to especially welcome our 150 young leaders, our guests who've come to us from Virginia and 50-some countries. Uh, we are all here as guests of a signature presidential precinct program. Uh, this morning should be very special. Our mission, our hope, is to help inform and train young leaders, leaders such as you see in this room, leaders such as you. Uh, as you heard from Neil on Monday, it's our hope that each of you will go out from here, make your country, your state, your community a better home for your country people. Um, at the precinct, it's our mission to turn the lessons of history and the events of the present to help better inform best practices for the future. So we often do this by introducing our visiting leaders to others who have, as we say in American slang, been there and done that. Uh, if you hope to meet a current leader who has been there and done that, a leader who understands the challenges of politics outside the headlines of New York and Beijing and London, a leader who appreciates the struggles faced by many smaller nations seeking progress in a globally integrated economy, a leader who's experienced a lifetime of personal triumphs and shortfalls and has survived them all, well, we have such a leader with us today. I'm going to spend a few extra minutes describing our guest's background for over his 72 years, he's had some remarkable experiences. Listen for those things in his story that you and your countries can relate to. Dr. Ralph Gonzalez is the current Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. St. Vincent's a small island nation of 150 square miles in the Eastern Caribbean. It has 110,000 citizens. It's spread over 32 islands. For over 200 years, St. Vincent was a colony controlled by Great Britain. In 1979, St. Vincent declared its independence and installed a parliamentary democracy. This summer, St. Vincent will become the smallest nation to ever hold a seat on the UN Security Council. Dr. Gonzalez has been there, involved in politics, from the dawn of his country's independence. He was younger than a few of you are here today when he began. He began his career as a practicing lawyer. He was first elected to Parliament in 1994, before a few of you were born. Dr. Gonzalez was first elected Prime Minister of St. Vincent in 2001, 18 years ago. Today, he is the longest currently serving democratically elected head of state in the Western Hemisphere. Dr. Gonzalez was born in a small, rural village of Colonnaire in St. Vincent on August 8, 1946. That makes him 22 years old, 22 days older than I am. So <laughs> his father was a farmer and a small businessman. His mother was a small businesswoman. His forefathers came to St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 1845 as indentured servants from the Portuguese ruled island of Madeira off the coast of Northwest Africa. Ralph Gonzalez attended Catholic primary school and then St. Vincent Boys Grammar School. There he went, from there, he went on to the University of the West Indies in Jamaica, where he obtained a bachelor's degree in economics, a master's degree in government. He went on to study at the University of Manchester in England, where he was awarded a PhD degree, PhD degree in government, and then at Gray's Inn, London, where he obtained his qualifications as a barrister. By then, he was a long way from his boyhood farm just as you all are probably a long way from home today. At university, Ralph Gonzalez participated in a full range of activities, including student politics, public speaking, debating, cricket, journalism, and he was the tenor pan player for the university's steel band. Uh, during his time there, he was a recipient of many student awards, and he was the first Vincentian student at the University of West Indies to have been chosen the student of the year the championship debater, and the guild or student body president. Early in his public life, Dr. Gonzalez was occasionally described as a Marxist or a socialist. 
In fact, uh, even today, he's still affectionately known as Comrade Ralph. Today, he governs a largely free market, democratic, capitalist country, but he will tell you he's always governed with a strong social conscience. During the Prime Minister's 18 years tenure at St. Vincent, he's become increasingly engaged in the global economy. St. Vincent's economy is evolving. What was once an agricultural nation is becoming a nation internationally renowned for tourism with a services-focused economy. While this has brought trade and jobs to the country, it has also created new challenges for its government. Through its membership in the United Nations and the Organization of American States, St. Vincent is exposed to a host of 21st century international challenges. The Prime Minister must contend with competing interests, seeking his vote at the UN and the OAS. Prime Minister Gonzalez can tell you about Taiwan and China vying for small countries' votes over the issue of the sovereignty of Taiwan. He can talk about negotiating an international whaling treaty with Japan. St. Vincent lies on a major drug trading route between Latin America and the Northern Hemisphere. He has to deal regularly with Interpol, the USDEA, and other international law enforcement agencies. St. Vincent's, regu Vincent's a regular beneficiary of foreign aid from Venezuela, from Cuba, and now from the Middle East where countries are all seeking to advance their standing in the international order. As tensions rise between these countries, it has often been Prime Minister Gonzalez who's had to play the role of broker. His banking industry is crucial to the foreign exchange of his small country, and yet, while he's pressured by many to keep an open liberal banking system, he's pressured by the EU and the UK and the US to ha abide by some international regulations for transparency uh, that might cripple his banking industry. So, this, and despite the prime minister's best interests or best, best efforts, unemployment is still high, around 15%, and wages are still low for many, but Education has been the hallmark of his presidency. For 18 years, he has stressed education. And during his tenure, St. Vincent's rankings in the Human Development Index scores have gone from the bottom quartile to the high category. St. Vincent's adult literacy rate is now 95.6%, up from the 30s when he took office. And the average lifespan of ascension is notably high. St. Vincent has a health care system, and it has a pension system, and it has notably high lifespan, average annual, average lifespan for countries in the region. So the questions of how small democracies, the non-nuclear nations, if you will, can best function in a globalized world are common. They're common for many of your countries. Smaller nations too often are offered no choice but to manage to foreign standards generated by unfamiliar issues imposed by distant bureaucracies, bureaucracies that are indifferent to the sovereignty of your nations. Managing these competing interests can demand particular political skills. Prime Minister Gonzalez has been addressing these challenges for 18 years. I hope that the experiences that he relates to you today and his observations on democracy will provide some valuable information that you might apply to your own situations at home. Before the Prime Minister begins, uh, please note that when he concludes, he will remain here and take questions from delegate heirs. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez and his wife, Eloise. Please come up. I want to thank Jim Murray and all the organizers of this event for their kindness and for their hospitality. I met this morning a magnificent young leader here in Virginia and others. And I'm very pleased to be here 
to speak with you, interact with you, answer your questions, and to learn from you. I want to thank Jim Murray for his introduction and for putting out certain basic facts about St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I'll make one addition in terms of backdrop. Though we are small, 150 square miles, we have a seascape of 11,000 square nautical miles. That's very important because it means that though the land on which we live is of great importance, the sea and its resources are at the center of our own developmental thrust. And the issues concerning global warming relate not only to matters of adaptation and mitigation in respect of the landscape, but also of the sea and the availability of resources and how do we protect those resources. Marine resources, fish and lobster and conch, um, tourism resources. We have to deal with the rising sea levels and the like. And where the matter of climate change has become urgent because the changes have been unusual and they have been unprecedented. And anyone who tells you about don't worry about climate change and de deny it, they will deny science. It's real and it's happening before our eyes and we see it in especially in small island developing countries. Now, we have been fashioned as a democracy. Colonialism, British colonialism came to us in 1763. There was a general carve up in the Eastern Caribbean between France and Britain. And Britain ruled basically uninterrupted, save and except for about five years in the, in the latter part of the 18th century. And we became internally self-governed in 1969 and independence, as Jim told you, in 1979. Now it is important to understand when a colonial state is established, what it does to a people. The foundation of any organized system of government, of any democracy, is something called citizenship. It is the highest office in the land. It is the one which joins all persons who are citizens in a political community or society organized as a state within a particular set of geographical boundaries. But if the state is imposed and doesn't arise as it did, for instance, in Europe and in several other countries of the world, as a consequence of the internal contradictions of the society. And this state is imposed and the imposition is emphasizing minimalist functions, collection of taxes, provision of basic services, and very importantly, the maintenance of law and order, and using the legal system as repressive. 
that those who are found there in such a society with an external imposition of a state that the ordinary man and woman, the ordinary citizen of this state which has been imposed from outside sees the state as a constellation of institutions to be used, misused, and abused, and therefore they have no commitment to it. And to have a true representative democracy, you have to own the state. It has to belong to you. You have to own your government. Now you will go and you will see, you read the internet, and you will see that there are, St. Vincent and Grandins is the only country in the Eastern Caribbean, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, which doesn't sell its passport and doesn't sell its citizenship. How can we? If citizenship is the highest office in the land, it's an interesting Jeffersonian concept. It's higher than president, it's higher than prime minister. And if it is the highest office in the land, and if it is the bond and the glue which keeps us together in something called an organized society, clearly that which is the highest office in the land cannot be sold. And the passport is the outward sign of the inward grace of citizenship. And that too cannot be sold. So those who would wish to sell those things in order to provide food, I say that is unsustainable and it is antithetical to sustainable development. Because hear me this and hear me well. If the state sells a citizenship, if the state sells the passport for money, what happens then? The ordinary citizen will say that the leaders are using, misusing, and abusing the state institutions. And if they can do that, we can do the same thing, and we should do the same thing until we can gather enough money to see if we can jump on a plane to come to the United States of America if Donald Trump will allow us to come in. So there is no commitment. And you may find, as W.B. Yeats puts it in the second coming, that the, the, the worst among us are full of passionate intensity and the best lack conviction and lack commitment, which is vital in the building of any representative democracy. Now I can read for you the preamble in our constitution, which would give a flavor as to what we have. It's, the words are really majestic. Whereas the people of the islands of St. Vincent, who are known as Vincentians, A, have affirmed that the nation is founded on the belief in the supremacy of God and the freedom and dignity of man and woman. B, desire that their society be so organized, so ordered as to express their recognition of the principles of democracy, free institutions, social justice, and equality before the law. C, realize that the maintenance of human dignity presupposes safeguarding the rights of privacy, 
of family life, of property, and the fostering of the pursuit of just economic rewards for labor. D, desire that their constitution should enshrine the above mentioned freedoms, principles, and ideals. And then a set of institutional arrangements are put in place and a set of protective provisions for fundamental rights and freedoms. In, a, in the usual parliamentary system, British style. Though it would be a mistake to think that what we have is a carbon copy of the British parliamentary system because you don't transpose Westminster and Whitehall across the Atlantic and it remains in its pristine form. But yet, we are faithful to the fundamental principles of representative democracy and freedom, separation of powers, all what you read in the textbooks. And I don't have to go through those because you're familiar with them. But then real flesh and blood people have to run these institutions. How did we come together as a people? Our country comprises largely migrant peoples, some who arrived freely and some who were enslaved. When the British came, they met about 10,000 persons, the Kalinago and the Garifuna. The Kalinago, what you would call the Yellow Caribs, and the Garifuna, the Black Caribs, a mixture between persons of African descent who had come there in various ways and run away from Barbados because Barbados had a slave society earlier. Barbados had flatlands, we had a lot of mountains, and still do have. Um, we have, the, there was a shipwreck in the late 17th century, the slave, slave ship and they came ashore. And in an earlier period, a small number of slaves brought there by French people on the western side of the island. When the British came, they owned, the Kalinago and the Garifuna owned all the land in common. There was a chief, a paramount chief. In 1764, the British made a mistake. They declared that all land belonged to the British crown. Well, if you come from London and Manchester, and you come all the way to St. Vincent, and you meet me with my land and you take it away from me, I will fight you. And for 31 years, between 1764 and 1795, a guerrilla war was fought against the British. And the might of the British Empire took a long time before they could subdue the Kalinago and particularly the Garifuna. Incidentally, the word Caribs is a derogatory term. I don't know if you know this. It means, it comes from the North Phoenician term, meaning fierce and warlike. And because the people reacted for the theft of their lands and for their subjugation, the Europeans called them fierce and warlike, but the people in their own language called themselves Kalinago, which meant the peaceful ones. Because we were there <laughs> living peacefully, and you came from where you came from to take my land, and I will fight you. It's elemental. Their people fight their neighbors over 100 square feet of land in the boundary, much less you come and take all the land and say it's yours. And then the British carried out genocide when they defeated the indigenous people and killed the paramount chief Chateauier, whom 
my government has installed as the first national hero of our country, the only one thus far. And they took, they killed a large number, then transported about 5,000 on a neighboring island, which is part of St. Vincent the Grenadines, called Baliso. They lived there for six months. Half of them died, they didn't have any water, they didn't have any food. And the other half were deported, exiled, to Rotan Island in the Bay of Honduras. And from there they went to Belize, to Guatemala, to Honduras, and to Nicaragua. And for these people, our Garifuna brothers and sisters, St. Vincent and the Grenadines is, a is their spiritual homeland known as Uremin. And Chateauier is a national hero in Guatemala, uh, sorry, yes, in Guatemala, known as Chateauier, though he never set foot there. And of course, the British wanted to plant sugar, so they brought in slaves. Between 1764 and 1807, when the slave trade ended. Some 55,000 slaves were landed and some 10,000 from West Africa died along the way coming to St. Vincent. About 65,000 were boarded. And then after slavery, came to an end in 1838. About 2,200 Madeirans were brought. Madeira is a tropical, subtropical island. Had, the British had brought some donkeys from Madeira and they did very well. And they thought it would be a magnificent idea if some two-legged ones had come when some of the slaves decided that they weren't going to go. Uh, go back on the plantations to work. And then a little later, some Indians came, who were brought as indentured servants. So that you notice the population mix already. You have the Anglo-Saxons who came as the colonialists, you have the indigenous people, you had the Africans, and you have the Indians, and later on some Chinese came, and then some Arabs, and so on. This country, up to the late 19th century, was a classic plural society, where each ethnic, racial, cultural section had its own relatively distinct pattern of sociocultural integration. Never the twain shall meet. They were in a society but there was, there was no core set of values among any of these groups. They were held together by force. But through the fever of history, remarkable things happen. And adjustments are made. Biology assists. And we grew to be a people with a core a set of shared values as to who we are, a wrong principles of how do we change peacefully and how we build representative institutions and to better our lives to such an extent that we have grown as a society which has become homogeneous you may not know this, you may not realize it, but perhaps you do if you think about it. People who identify themselves to the census taker, or who are identified as the census taker, in St. Vincent has been, a, been Portuguese, less than 500. The majority of the population, 90 percent of African descent, 
and yet you have someone who looks like me, who doesn't look like my Surinamese brother, whom the bulk of the population would look like, that I've been the most popular politician in the country for the last 20 years. This is not an Obama movement in reverse. <laughs> we take this as something which is normal because of the way in which the society has evolved and because of the way in which I myself developed. And the, the folk molded me and they helped me to be where I am. Now, Jim made the point that we have an economy of largely of services, which is true now, about 80% of our economy, services. When I came to office in 2001, I led the first government, which never had since 1763, an economy where an agricultural commodity dominated. In succession, we had sugar, arrowroot, cotton, bananas, last for the, between 1956 and say, 1995, bananas. They were the, the major income owner. When I came to office in a situation where bananas had gone, because Britain entered the European single market and economy and the banana preferences went. And you want to have services, but if you want to have tourism, you need educated people. If you want to have banking services, if you want to have um, fishing done other than how it was done by Peter on the Sea of Galilee, <laughs> you need educated people. But only 39% of the 12-year-olds were at secondary school, what you call high school. Within five years, I had all of them in secondary school. I carried out an education revolution, which is thoroughgoing. And I'm on target for one university graduate per household on an average by the year 2030. Remarkable changes have taken place in that regard, and we have in dividends. We need to have, you can't have tourism and other services unless you have proper air services, and therefore build a modern international airport and organize proper air services. Doing the same thing with the port. These are important cross-cutting developmental issues. Uh, there's a gentleman, His Excellency Donald J. Trump, who has an acute understanding of small islands, or islands, remember, in when Hurricane Maria struck Puerto Rico, he didn't respond with the alacrity that some of his critics thought that he should. Uh, and he said his critics didn't understand Puerto Rico, that Puerto Rico is an island surrounded by water, as though islands can be surrounded other than by water. <laughs> And just in case you missed the point, he said, big water, <laughs> ocean water. And I agree entirely with the president for having such an acute and profound understanding of islands. <laughs> we are surrounded by big water, ocean water. We can't, we can't get from there to elsewhere by road or by rail. So we have to fix up our airports, our air transportation, and our ports and our sea transportation. And importantly, if we want to be an example to everybody in this era of climate change, we had to go green. By February 2022, 80% of the electricity in my country would be generated by renewable energy. All these are work, are works of a democratically elected government in free and fair elections periodic every five years. 
We don't have term limits. So I can go as long as the people would want me to go, or as long as Eloise permits me to go. Energy, critical. Another important cross-cutting issue. We have 20% of our energy already by three small hydroelectric plants. We, we are doing solar, and we're at the, pro, at the, the, the moment um, put in the production, bore, the bore wells in the holes for geothermal energy, of which we have an abundance. Of course, the price of energy would fall by at least 25%, which makes a big difference in terms of the competitiveness. And um, we'll have energy security and all the rest. And there are many things. In, I met poverty. I met indigence of 25.6% of the population. It's now 3.9%. Intractable, that small amount. But still, we are working assiduously on it. Now, many important changes have had to be made. And I'll tell you this. Elections, change in a parliamentary democracy, in a representative democracy, and particularly in the age of the internet, not an easy business. Not an easy business at all. It may well be easier to effect change through commandist government. The only thing is this, change through commandist government always is tenuous and it would not be long lasting because another commander will come and change it. But if it is deeply embedded in the laws and it arises from a consensus in the society. If ever they were to kick my butt, or I demit, whoever comes after will have to be very careful if they make alterations to initiatives which the people have already voted upon and which the people see embedded in a legislative jurisprudential basis. You'd have to go to parliament to change them. You'd have to have discussion, uh, private sector groups, civil society groups, and so on, going to be involved. So you can't change it in this way. Now, it means that you have to master everything about parliamentary democracy, and you have to know in elections, and you have to have a lot of patience. The person you see standing in front of you, I'm now 50 years as a political activist. And I've contested every single parliamentary election since independence in 1979. I'm the only one in my country who has been a participant in every parliamentary election. 40 years. And a lot of people thought, well, why is this guy, he has a PhD in political economy. He has his legal training. He's called to the bar of England and Wales. He can make a living anywhere. Why is he spending all this time? doing this, I want to tell you, those who endure wilderness years are likely, if ever they get to office, will last longer. It's important for wilderness years if you want to make change. You have commitment and sacrifice. It doesn't come easily. What I'm telling you is not something new. You read the Hebrew Bible. 
There's Moses, there's Joshua, there's the prophet building Nehemiah. And once I told the parliament in St. Vincent and the Grenadines when they didn't quite understand wilderness years. And, and then I said humorously, and there is Ralph. No, you have to build organizations. You want to be a leader? You better love people. That's the first requisite. You have to love people. Oh, I'm sure all of you are bright. Many of you have degrees and doing graduate degrees and so on and so forth. Carlos can tell you, Senator James. When they come, all the young men and women, I said the first requisite, you love people. And don't love them in some marginal kind of manner. You love them. in a focused way. You love them in a manner in which tempests cannot shake you. And you have a clear vision as to where you want to go and you're organized. Now, I'm a Roman Catholic, and there are two principles on leadership in the church which are useful for consideration. The first one, it is said in the church that once you sing in the choir, you can be pope. So that there's nothing wrong with having an ambition. Once you're singing in the choir, the papacy is not outside of your reach. But the ambition inherent in that proposition is constrained by a beautiful hymn. The words of a beautiful hymn, they say, the good Lord shows his face on he or she who waits his or her turn. You have to be in communion with the people. They have to knock you about. I'll tell you this. Today, when I go to a political rally, they're all the modern paraphernalia. And 10, 15,000 people are there. And there's music and everything, all the razzmatazz modern mobilization. But it didn't start like that. That's where you build it. I had a small party, small political party. On a Thursday night, I'll have an executive meeting and we'll decide that we'll go in into a, a particular area in the countryside to have a political meeting on the Saturday at five o'clock in the evening. I had an old Cortina car, the steering wheel tough like a truck. I had in the trunk the four funnel horns. You know, remember those old funnel horns? Well, you probably wouldn't remember them because I had a small black amplifier on the back seat and I have, I have a, the, the car has a 12 volt battery I set up my amplifier and everything with this 12 volt battery. And I await my colleagues to come. Nobody else turns up. The girlfriend wants the car. They had to go somewhere else. Good people. But you have to have discipline and you have to do this thing well. But I wouldn't go away. I'll be the chairman of the meeting. I'll say the opening prayer. I'm the chairman. 
I'm the first speaker. I'm the second speaker. I'm the third and fourth speaker. I will speak for three hours or thereabouts nonstop. And when I'm finished, on every subject under the sun, I give the benediction. I take up my equipment. I go into certain areas, they're so hostile. The people wouldn't even come out. As soon as I set up, they close their doors and their windows. I'm speaking. You're hearing me. Sometimes I would speak to audiences consisting of an old man, a fat woman, and a dog. The dog being the most attentive of my three listeners. <laughs> but then I will go there in the week, and I'll talk to the people. And two weeks later, I will go back. And then you see a few people out. Then I will go back again. And then after the meeting, a family would ask me if I am not hungry, if I want some food to eat, please come and eat some food because you talk too much tonight. And then you're making progress because you're learning. People see your love. It's tangible. It's real. And don't, don't worry. You will make history. As soon as the sun, sun rises. But remember this always, that great leaders make history. Great men and women make history, but only to the extent that the circumstances of history permit them so to make. So you have to, like, one of the least recognized of the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel, Issachar. And you read the book of Chronicles, and there's a simple line about Issachar. Issachar knew the times, and he acted accordingly. You have to know the times. You have to understand people. You have to know their possibilities, and you have to know their strengths. You have to know their limitations and you have to know their weaknesses. You have to study the whole extant circumstances as to what you're doing. I know you would attend a lot of formal courses on leadership. And you'd read books which emphasize that you must inspire people, and that's true. And a leader must inspire. A leader must put in. But far more important for a leader to do is to draw out. To draw out of the people whom he or she is leading. To draw out of them their goodness, their qualities, their nobility, and to draw out of them their qualities, their strengths, their possibilities, their goodness, their, their nobility, and draw out of them that which they do not as yet know that they possess. If you do that, you would have achieved a high mark, a high distinction in leadership. I have been prime minister for 18 years. As Jim said, I'm the longest serving head of government in the hemisphere. I never thought that that will happen. In the dark days of the wilderness, I didn't even know whether I'd become a leader for one day, much less to 18 years. But you do what you think that you have to do. 
and you build. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we don't believe, and I don't believe in bling. I'm not a bling man. I don't believe in doing things which are not sustainable. And I explain to people why. I tell the people of my country that there is no progressive society anywhere in the world which has been built on leisure, pleasure, and nice time. I love leisure, I love pleasure, and I love nice time. I'm a Caribbean man to my bones. But if I don't produce, if I don't work hard or smart, I can't do leisure, I can't do pleasure, and I can't do nice time. I'll have to take it from somebody else to have leisure, pleasure, and nice time. There's too much emphasis on leisure, pleasure, and nice time, and not enough on hard and smart work. A progressive society must work hard and smart. But as our constitution says, you must have just rewards, just economic rewards for your labor, vital. And we agree at those in a consensual way. St. Vincent and the Grenadines has to make use of its instruments of sovereignty and independence to mobilize resources private sector and also state resources, resources from developmental partners and institutions. To do so, it must always be very careful and always be very prepared and always have a clear path forward. You may be surprised to hear we, had, we built an international airport and you may say, what's difficult about that? Well, our country is mountainous. People wanted to build one for 50 years. Nobody knew how to do it. To build an airport in St. Vincent, I had to move three big hills and one mountain. I had to span a stream and a river. I had to move 140 middle and upper middle income houses and cause them to be built elsewhere. I had to move a church and a cemetery for starters. I built an airport without the imprimatur of any country in Europe or in North America built entirely on the basis of South-South cooperation. And we started without any money. But if you do it right, you will get it done. And nothing is too difficult for you to achieve. Currently, St. Vincent and the Grenadines is the president of ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, one of the major institutions. We're the smallest country ever. We're the third Caribbean country since 1945 to head ECOSOC. Jamaica did it and Haiti, nobody else. And we are on target now to be the smallest country ever to be a non-permanent member of the Security Council. We started this quest 12 years ago. I didn't know I was going to be in office at this time, but we built it and we did our work. And now it is more than likely, it, indeed it would be a surprise 
if we didn't get two thirds of the General Assembly on June the 7th to sit as a non-permanent member of the Security Council. And we have done it without spending one cent in relation to anybody who is supporting us. We did it with ideas and sincerity, clarity of thought, and just work on an ongoing basis. Just think of it. St. Vincent and Grenadines, given our small size, sitting in 2020 and 2021, deciding on matters of world peace and security with the five permanent members, United States of America, Britain, France, Russia, and China. And be one of 10 non-permanent members elected for two years. You know, in the preparation for that, I have on my staff at the United Nations, young people, not older than you, who speak Mandarin Chinese, who speak Russian. French and Spanish is par for the course. If I need somebody with the ability to speak the language of the Turks, I can have, because I have at home. The world is hostile to small island states. Climate change is an existential matter of ex existential significance. But I can't put my hands behind me and sit on them. I have to do the only thing that human beings have done from the beginning. Come to terms with nature. Come to terms with the external environment and work out among ourselves and we have the experience, the knowledge of people like Jefferson and, and others of the founding fathers in the, in the great United States to build something which is lasting. Thank you very much. Thank you again so much, Prime Minister Gonsalves, for not only joining us, uh, but also for your remarks uh, this morning. What I'd like to do is kick off our Q&A with a question and then open it up to the audience, sure. allowing for three questions and asking that you respond to all three of those at once. In your remarks, you talked a great deal about the darkness and the weariness periods of time. And as an individual who has been in elected office since the very beginning of the independence of your country, I imagine that you have seen these dark days, these weariness, wilderness days. And I'd like for you to really emphasize that term you used of enduring uh, with a room full of future leaders that will guide their own countries uh, establish their own visions for uh, the direction their countries will take, I believe that that endurance is significant. I'd like to know more about what that means to endure in uncertain times. Um, you've had to balance uh, competing priorities socially, politically, economically. You've had to manage, you know, scandal, criticism. And being able to endure all of that is critical to, I believe, the accomplishments and successes that you mentioned towards the end of your remarks. Well, I think, uh, thank you very much. And, and you have been inspiring. You are inspiring. <laughs> thank you. Look, you have to believe in yourself. You have to have a clear idea as to where you're going. And you have to have good support systems. You have to build structures, you and your colleagues. And when you are at a stage in your life that you, if you consider it necessary and desirable to have a spouse, 
make sure that that spouse shares what you are about. When I was getting married to Eloise, I, I said to her, listen, the journey I'm on is a very difficult one. If you want an easy life, let me just leave you here. I say you, I was in opposition, I was struggling. I say in addition to being married to you, I have two mistresses. One is known as politics and the other one is law. And you will maintain suzerainty by making sure that those two mistresses don't take over and to have some sense of balance and it's important um, and if you think that you are in this business of leading in politics to make money stay in something else Now, there are different styles that people will have. But styles of leadership and how you do it is really depend on all the circumstances and your own persona. I told Neil when I was talking to him about this very question. A young person coming into leadership, don't get too obsessed with your brightness. You know, there are two kinds of brightness. Brightness which blinds and the brightness which illuminates. If I'm driving my SUV in your direction and you're coming in mine and both of, our, both of us are on high beam, there's a lot of brightness, but we're not seeing each other. You have to be able to clear the pathway and work with people. And you look at what are the main events. The people who are always going to try and take you up detract from you, including in, the, 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 in this age of the internet. I mean, there are all kind of crazies who will say all sorts of things and fake news and all the rest of things. You just don't bother about those things. You know, we have a word in the Caribbean, certainly in my country, a word, it's, it's spelled C-O-M-M-E-S-S, -S, commess. Commerce means vituperative language used against you, slander, defamation, um, uh, innuendo, all sorts of made up stories. And you simply tell the people that you may run a campaign on commerce, but you can't run a government on commerce. I believe that in the United States of America, it would be well advised for a number of presidential candidates to bear that simple truth in mind. You can run a campaign, maybe on commerce, but you can't run a government on commerce and you have a lot more sensible people than foolish people who are listening. Thank you so much. I'm going to, at this time, now open the floor to three questions, and I'll take the first question here. Thank you very much. Uh, Excellency Prime Minister, thank you for the opening remarks and for all your inspiring uh, speech. I am Genti from Albania, a small country as well, of three millions in the Balkans. Um, my question would be, uh, is related to something that, that you mentioned, that you will uh, run for office as long as your people vote you and as long as your wife is fine with that. So uh, this is the same more or less issue that 
we're facing, uh, some scholars are, are commenting on, on Angela Merkel, the chancellor, saying that enough should be enough. And sometimes the elites should change and new generations should not be prime ministers, but should create the path for, for new uh, leaders to, to, to come in. There is a, a huge consensus that you are, I was reading yesterday international media comments on you, are very charismatic leader, well-respected, intelligent and everything. But don't you think that elites should, be, should circulate and maybe uh, limit the mandate of the prime minister or of the president to two or up to three mandates, maybe? Yeah, and before you respond, we're going to take oh, the other sorry. two. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, here. Good, uh, good morning, Prime Minister. My name is Jaquel Goodwin. I am a student at Hampton University and a Virginia delegate. Um, you talked about ordinary women and men should feel represented and own the government. How do you um, entice the people to feel motivated uh, during trying times um, and through rural circumstances? And I'll take one additional question here. I, I think there's a young lady. OK, fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Me? Okay. Um, hi. Um, I'm Lidiana. I'm a social entrepreneur from Brazil. Thank you very much for being here with us and for um, taking the time to inspire young leaders to take leadership and be responsible. Um, I would love to add a question to, to what has been said. Um, that is, how do you see your role in mentoring and in training new people to be in positions of power in the country? Thank you. Yes. My brother from Albania, in the circumstances of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, I do not believe in term limits. Generally speaking, in parliamentary democracies, in prime ministerial systems, as distinct from presidential ones. There are always challenges institutionally in dealing with term limits. The people within your party and within the electorate will decide when to get rid of you. We did it to Margaret Thatcher. Um, they did it to Tony Blair. I'm using the British parliamentary system. They, they, it looks as though they want to do it to Theresa May. I would want to demit. I want to do something which hasn't been done before in our politics in the Caribbean. I wanted to give up my job as prime minister and have a younger member of the cabinet become prime minister. And I will serve dutifully under his leadership. Unfortunately, ladies, the, the, the two young men, the two young persons who are poised to take over from me, uh, there's no young woman as yet. In, in that group, though that they're, they're good young women in the, in, in, in the party, qualified young women, but they're not yet at the ministerial level and, and therefore wouldn't be seen as possible success as yet. But I went, I went to my central executive, asked them to release me. Carlos will tell you, I was the only member of the executive who voted for me to go. <laughs> I did it twice. <laughs> Within a month of each other. Then I went to the National Council, which is the, consists of the delegates of the party from across the country. And as I was speaking, I said, well, listen, I want to talk about this question of succession. And they said, no, 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 no. The executive has already decided that. We don't want to hear any talk about succession. 
you're staying there. Then I go to the National Convention, which is the large body. Mm -hmm. And I walked in with Eloise. As the chairman has the session opening. And as he saw Eloise and I coming down the corridor, for the next 15 minutes, he said, I want to talk to comrade sister Eloise about something. And the thrust of his, his, the chairman's party, I mean speech, was that the party needed me for a fifth, to go for a fifth consecutive election victory by the end of 2020. And uh, the women, more than half of the convention were women. They got up and they shouted and told her that they know that she's married to me, but they're also married to me. <laughs> and I am needed. So I would really like to go. <laughs> Maybe you can help me <laughs> to, 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 to get a better amended lyrics of Engelbert Humperdinck's Please release me, let me go. <laughs> but that, you don't know Engelbert Humperdinck, eh? I uh, know, uh, I think that's gone all over your head, I tell you. <laughs> uh, do the polls, the polls, the polls tell me all the time that though I'm 72, I'm going to be 73 in August, that I'm the most popular politician among young people in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Right? So clearly, the, the, the young people have a, a, a soft spot for the elderly. <laughs> um, now, the questions asked by our, my comrade sister and my comrade here. I use the word comrade a lot because it means solidarity, oneness. If you come to the airport in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and you say, oh, I'm, I'm, what are you going to do? You come in, you tell the immigration officer, well, I have an appointment with the comrade. They say, you know the comrade? I believe they will help you get through a little easier through immigration. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Our party is democratically organized, and we have groups throughout the constituency, throughout the, the, the country. And the opportunity is for young people to come and participate. But what we do very well is that we link with civil society groups to train a young person in politics while you'd like to have them in the party, if they're not yet wanting to come into the party, for whatever reason, don't lock them out. They may be involved in a, a woman's group, a youth group, a trade union, a small business group, whatever it is. And they can build their skills and, and get the awareness and everything, and you work with them. Um, and consciously, and I'm coming to yours, and consciously, the leader has to try to build. The two, the two young men who are in, are in line, the party sees, I'm not talking anything out of turn, the party sees them as my likely successors. One is the Minister of Finance. He is 46. And one is the Minister of Agricultural Industry, and there he's 37. And both of them are very able. They did very well at school, at university. They're, um, 
lots of good experience. And um, Carlos will tell you that I'm harder on them than I'm on anybody else in the party because I expect more of them. For instance, if, if they were to come late to a cabinet meeting, they'll get a real rough time from me. If one of the older guys come, I'll say, man, why are you late? What happened? And he'll give an excuse. I say, well, you know, you're not supposed to be late. But any of these two, ooh, <laughs> uh, they, 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 they know what's required. But we can do far more than we are doing in terms of training. Part of the trick in changing the economy, transforming it, as I've indicated, is while you're transforming to recognize that real flesh and blood people have to live. So in 2001, where we were, I said, look, we have to build an economy. Our quest is to build a modern, competitive, many-sided, post-colonial economy, which is at once national, regional, and global. Modern and competitive education, applied science and technology. Many-sided, you do tourism, you have to do agriculture, fruits and vegetables in a particular way. You have to do fishing, you have to do other things. ICT, you know, I, I, I'll borrow money from the World Bank, for instance. And I'll give grants to young people through a, a particular system to build entrepreneurship among young people in, say, ICT. They don't have to pay back the money. I give them that to start up. They, of course, they have to have a business plan, there's a program, and we have proper structures to make them, um, uh, to have them do their work and to get their money in tranches and the like. It has to be post-colonial because nobody owes us a living. There are no preferences. It has to be regional. That's why I'm strong with regionalism. Our major export, our exports of goods, not to North America anywhere, but to the region. Um, our tourists come from overseas, further in the United States and the like. And, and um, we, we have to get, make that global connection. But while we are, while we are transforming the economy, and put it on a sustainable footing. And if you want to see what they are, you can look at the 17 Sustainable Development Goals um, adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in September 2015. The, the, the framework is basically there. And, and I will tell you, do I come from the left of the political spectrum? Like Deng Xiaoping, it doesn't matter to me what the color of the cat is so long as it catches my eye. In other words, what works is, is, is an experience teaches what, what, what works. And I build a good social infrastructure and do a lot of creative things to, to, to make sure that I reduce poverty and, and, and children don't go to bed hungry at night. I, I have a, an excellent school feeding program um, for children in the primary school. Uh, it's, it's seen as the best um, school feeding program in our part of the world. I have programs, the Youth Empowerment Service, the Support for Education and Training programs for young people. I do a lot of things, targeted specific interventions and do them in a creative, non-expensive way so that we can, we can help people along. And 
if you come, if you come by my office any day, Jim Murray, who has been there, you will see 30, 40, 50 people waiting outside my office daily. They come to see me. Of course, I can't see 30, 40, 50 people, but I have structures to see them. But there are people who walk off the streets and whom I see without appointments. I fit them in. If they, sometimes I will tell my staff, I say, tell them that they can hang around. I say, where they came from? They say, well, this one came from the northeast of the island. I say, well, she would have left home very early this morning. Make sure she, that she gets um, coffee or tea and biscuits um, so that while she waits while I, I get around to her. And, and they will wait to see me. And uh, so there's an advantage also of size. But I don't feel, I don't feel overburdened by having to see people because they give me a lot of information. And bureaucrats, public servants, when they come and tell me things, I say, but that's not what I heard this morning from people who came to visit me. And when I tell this, they come to me on a daily basis. If I'm seeing the American ambassador and people turn up, and people turn up, I will go out and tell them, I said, listen, I'm going to be with the American ambassador today, and after that I have this. I have structures and systems to take care of you. Um, a couple of you may want to, may have to see me, but you just have to hold on. And they will wait, because they know, they have the confidence that if I give them my word that I will see them that day, even though it takes until 5 o'clock, I will see them. And they will wait in patience because you have established a bond. It's, <laughs> there's a certain mystical thing about it, I must tell you. It, it's, it's, it's amazing. And after a while, um, even my political opponents will have to concede that, well, he keeps in touch with his people. And, um, and you have to do it. But you can't do it unless you love people, my brothers and sisters, my comrades. You can't do it. Any time you get cynical with people, get out of this business of leading people. Thank you, you so much. Prime can't Minister. do it at all. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Prime Minister Gonzalez for joining us today. <laughs>